like uh, Alfredo mentioned, uh, please, any questions that uh, you have, you can put them in the chat and I will read them to uh, Lee uh, at the end of his uh, lecture. And, and Lee, let us know if you want to be, if you can be interrupted or you want to have the questions at the end. So with that in mind, Lee, you can take a presenter. I think you, if you have the... Uh, Yes, uh, thanks very much and uh, nice to, uh, I look forward to interacting with all of you. Uh, we can make this as interactive as you would like. I feel, please feel free to ask questions at any time. And thanks so much, Eduardo and um, Alfredo. And uh, I look forward to all, interacting further with all of you now. Uh, let's see. Hey, you know, next slide and I will do that for you. You can stop. So the floor is your leg. Okay, let me just find where I am. Okay, well, um, was the presentation up? So now I can see it. All right, so good. So let's let's uh, jump. So the the front picture shows that my campus, the way it was uh, pre-COVID. Uh, let's little view out my window, and uh, and also the Mountaineer Gongo volcano. The second picture is from. Democratic Republic of Congo. And part of our, my message is, you know, we all have uh, development needs everywhere around the world. And some of the technologies and approaches for infrastructure that can work at the edge, can work at the edge in Canada, in the United States, uh, the Congo and elsewhere. And that's where we'll go from here. So I'll go on to the next one, or if you can move to the next slide. All right, so we're going to talk some a little bit about like early lessons on edge infrastructure. So that's what we could consider the internet backpack, uh, which is behind me. Oh, let's see, am I? Um, and, and you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, all right, so I got some echo test going. Okay. Um, okay, so um, so we're going to basically uh, review some of the uh, efforts we've made over time, exploring bringing a new infrastructure or what we might call cyber physical infrastructure to the edge that could work with the same quality and characteristics as the internet does in Toronto, in Syracuse, New York, in any major city. So meaning that you have always on, always available access to the internet, uh, no matter where we are in the world. Um, and we have uh, been working on this for in various ways for some time in having actual uh, field deployed units since 2017, so the last three years. So we'll talk some about some of the lessons from bringing uh, new infrastructure into different parts of the world, uh, from Africa, Latin America, and to indigenous communities. And then we'll also talk some about like, how do you develop this cyber infrastructure? What does it take? Which in this case was a lot of years of research, um, 18 years to be precise, to think about the internet and the cloud and the edge. So that's part of one of the big lessons or things I'm trying to get you all to um, keep in mind. The, the internet you know, allows, allows everything to connect, but what are we connecting? And we're connecting both major data centers where websites and information and all kinds of different tools and resources are, but we're also connecting edge devices like cell phones, like um, Gotennas, like now the internet backpack. So if we think about things carefully to design for new infrastructure capabilities, but do it in a way that is flexible and can take advantage of uh, different types of resources, we can make new advances possible. Next slide, please. All right, and I should have emphasized that uh, all of this we're, we're talking about is, you know, what are the implications for internet governance? So I want to first talk about this uh, first internet backpack test. You know, how, do, how does a professor in upstate New York end up with a backpack in the Congo? Uh, well, like I said, we've been doing much, a lot of research 
and um, and we demonstrated it. But uh, UNICEF had invited my, me and my students for um, to come out to a session called in, "In Case of Emergency" that was held at Google headquarters in 2016 because of prior work we'd done on essentially what we were calling worst case scenario survival as a service. Okay, so we're, now we're living in a pandemic. So, so back then it seemed kind of like, why are you, well, we were worrying about basically making, trying to make it possible to communicate no matter what, no matter how bad it was. So the analogy would say, if you're buried under the rubble at an earthquake, the earthquake in Haiti, you wanna be able to send at least a text message to the next person under the rubble to hope that they can relay a message to somebody not under the rubble to help you out. So having it, uh, so this is over many years, that's what the many years of National Science Foundation research was about, having, uh, thinking through resilient and sustainable communications that could work across many different networks, some of them on the internet, some of them not on the internet. So both on grid and off grid. Uh, so, so this is all great or you know, interesting academic research and working with many different corporate partners over a very long time. We won't go through the whole saga, but, uh, but by 2016, you know, we were, we had something pretty cool when we went out to that event in San Francisco, we was, you know, it was the Googles, the Facebooks, um, all, all at the apples, all the big companies saying, you know, this is what we have in case of an emergency, which would be some social media app or some tracking thing. It's essentially saying, assuming there is no emergency and your phone is working, this is how we can help you. And we are the ones saying, assume nothing, nothing's working. It's a real emergency and we can still help you. You can still communicate. And uh, so that the, re the reaction and response from that event was very positive. And, no, am I am I muted again? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Can you, sorry. Did you hear me? Oh wait. Wait. Let me get, get one, one of these. Is this okay? Now we okay, can so hear you. I'm sorry, but you have, open, you have to open you have two windows. Yeah, you have two mics open. Okay, now try it yes. again. Okay. Well, but now I got to find the presentation. But uh, um, okay. Well, uh, where are we? Okay, so we're back. Okay, so now we're back. Basically, that's where we are in 2016, having definitely something that responds well, but um, we hadn't field tested it. We, we had done uh, you know, various research efforts, working also with public safety officials and others in upstate New York. But okay, so, so, that, so we were getting a positive response. And then from interactions through partners, uh, the director of the Goma Volcano Observatory heard about this internet backpack and they started basically nagging me saying we need this we need this we need to be able to communicate we have this like da very dangerous volcano we need it like yesterday and so it went basically quickly from we were saying well we're not really ready for this you know there isn't in in wealthy United States there wasn't that level of support but quickly we went from um, the the um, concept to saying the very first one ever so this is like where the highest point was went to support the goma volcano observatory dealing with the third most dangerous volcano where lava flows at you know 50 miles an hour down from this very dangerous volcano there's underground uh, there's lava chutes that flow under that city that's in that opening picture there's co2 gases under the lake so it's it's an ongoing emergency it's a worst case scenario to live next to the third most dangerous volcano in the world, and many people do in the city of Goma. That's not to mention all the other crises that they have there with uh, many different uh, groups fighting, with uh, widespread poverty, with uh, illness, Ebola. 
uh, many different problems, but they insisted on getting the very first internet backpack and it's been in continuous use since then. So we'll go to the next slide, please. So this is what the first one could do. And remember we were saying we wanted to be able to communicate no matter what. So if you can, uh, can you communicate with the cell tower, great, 3G or 4G, wonderful. If you can't, that the Go10 and the Things network are basically low bandwidth, limited IoT network capable services. If essentially, if you can't reach the internet, you can still send a text message and your GPS coordinates and an information or sensor data across those networks. The Thraya is a satellite network, obviously, with uh, which of course is much more expensive, but it also included a Wi-Fi hotspot, so you could sort of connect other devices to the satellite, not just one device, like a like a satellite phone. Um, of course, there's GPS, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi, and then we had these grid stream applications at the time, which were early versions, of what we call edgeware. So you're going to remember that word, edgeware. And now to and of course there was the internet. Next slide. So uh, basically what we, we, the first test was saying, can this work in this ongoing the, you know, disaster scenario of Mount Niragongo volcano? And essentially at the top of the mountain, uh, nothing worked except for the Thuraya and um, which was, you know, the satellite, but even there, it's a, the conditions because of the active volcano, there's gases rising. The person who took this up there, he's still working with us, but he, he spent four days in the hospital after doing this test. He almost died, but, uh, but, the, but the backpack worked. Uh, next slide. So again, this basically see nothing, you couldn't use any internet service. You could sort of do a ping test, but, uh, but really the only thing that worked was our edgeware, our software design to work in this like cross network, cross device, edge network circumstance, uh, that still worked. So we were successful. And because of that, we have continued to be used by the Goma Volcano Observatory and also for education and also for uh, IoT use. It's obviously difficult circumstances there uh, with, um, with, with many different uh, groups fighting with UN peacekeepers. There's more UN peacekeepers in uh, North Kivu province in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo than anywhere else, else in the world. But, but we proved there that this technology could work when nothing else could work. Next slide. From uh, that first test, we've gone on to take the backpack in uh, small numbers into many different countries from Costa Rica to Kenya and Liberia and have ex developed sort of uh, infrastructure models that would work bo both with the internet backpack and with low cost, uh, unlicensed wireless uh, network infrastructure to bring a uh, a, 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 a potential national internet research and education network into any place on earth. The, the backpack is great, but on its own, it's, you know, obviously if you're having to reach out to satellite, that's not cheap. But if, if that's all you can reach, then what you wanna do is have a way to use as little bandwidth as possible, right? So with the internet backpack, we're able to use, so basically it's a form of, of um, you could say data compression, so that only the, if basically, if you're on top of a volcano, you don't wanna, you're not gonna be watching Netflix, right? You're not going to be wanting to look at any ads. You're not gonna want anything that's gonna distract from whatever important information you're communicating, which is like, I'm alive and where I am and how I can, uh, how I can be reached if, if somebody needs to save me. So we've had, many different examples uh, in and work with many different governments and well as private companies. And, uh, and the, one, the one, one example on the left is there's a, you know, an island um, in Costa Rica, which has 250 people, no running water, no electricity, no internet. And uh, last year we went there with a backpack and in four minutes, 
they're connected. They're speaking to government ministers. They're getting support in a way they never could before, which has now led to more resources coming, saying basically they were forgotten, right? They were, they were, they were nobody cared about them. Now it's a community where other investment and new resources are coming in. And um, let me see. Um, and let me see. And we could say in the picture on the right is showing there's there's a group called the One Planet Education Network that we work with that runs essentially sustainable education, STEM learning programs. Uh, George Newman is pictured up. He's the one with the cap on in the upper left. Um, and they're working on sustainable agriculture projects, um, often with uh, West Bungoma province in Kenya, but also other countries and New York City schools. And, and literally they're helping uh, revive agriculture in areas that have been damaged by, you know, by, by, by the in various insects um, and, 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 and learning from each other uh, as, as uh, not always with the internet backpack, but using the internet and the resources. So, so we have, uh, again, different examples of how, you know, th this picture from on the right is, I think that's about three months old. Uh, since the spring, um, and um, and 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 yes, we we I could I see the comments from Kapil about India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan. Uh, the the backpack has been um, demonstrated in uh, Pakistan, and there is a partnership in place to uh, bring it to India as well, but it ha it hasn't yet been deployed there. Well, we'll talk more about that in a second. Next slide. Okay, so what are we talking about actually in terms of uh, infrastructure? So this is why I think this is edge infrastructure. This is all you need to connect anywhere in the world, uh, except the North Pole and the South Pole, because uh, they're the we don't have the satellites um, don't over, over the over the North and South Pole, we need a different satellite antenna. But if you look there on the right, and let me see. Um, um, can, can you, if I turn my, this around, can you see what's on my desk? No? Yes, we, we can. We could actually okay. see. All right. Okay. So so on my desk here, this this is the satellite antenna. These are the two smartphone or oh, this is my personal phone. These are the ones that come with the backpack. This is a battery that uh, charges the different devices. These are the go tennis that can be tethered to the smartphones. So you so basically even if there's no cell signal, you can send a text message from one phone uh, to another over several kilometers. And then over here we have the, um, this connects either, to, this is a cradle point router for either um, connecting to cell phone or Wi-Fi. And here's the uh, solar panel that basically you can, you can recharge the battery in about 10 hours. And then with the bat and with this battery, you can recharge all these devices and you can see what's not there, which what doesn't come with the backpack is a cell phone, is a laptop or any larger computer because this is both a you know communications connectivity system and it's also a mini microgrid so it's carefully energy balanced and that from by design from the beginning uh, because essentially if you're if you're you well you you can't drain basically we needed uh, to make sure that this could be sustainable indefinitely for for in forever basically so as long as you just get some sunlight you can recharge everything and keep going and keep communicating. Um, so I see the question about which satellites we, uh, the backpack connects to. Um, we, we started, as, as was mentioned in the prior slides, using uh, Thoraya's, which is a, or a company called ORB3, which has good signal connectivity for parts of Southern Africa. But we also now this is this uh, the, this one is a from Inmarsat. The satellite we're using now is from Inmarsat, which has good global coverage worldwide, and they're they're a good partner with us. 
And so basically, we and there's other satellite companies we work with. So we're not the backpack itself. It's important to remember is it's the composition, it's the edgeware, it's the design approach to think not just about when we're not optimizing for Wi-Fi, we're not optimizing for satellite, we're not optimizing for 4G, we're optimizing for worst case scenario survival as a service. So any basically we can work with any satellite company uh, and we're probably working with three or four now. Uh, with like they say right now, uh, Inmarsat being the preferred provider of that device. But, but we also recognize that, you know, th this, uh, if, if you really did want to have streaming video or watch Netflix, this, this is not going to do it. You're going to want a slightly larger uh, device. So there's several other satellite companies, which I won't name, and vendors that, that um, including Canadian companies, that, that could all be part of the uh, package. Um, so depending on where you are, what you're trying to do, we could work with a different one. Right now, we we love Inmarsat because uh, they're pretty much, you know, it's the international, the old International Maritime Satellite Organization. So they have very good worldwide uh, coverage. And it's important to remember these, we're getting, everything we're doing is as a data plan. We're not doing like we're being charged for minutes as a cell phone, as a satellite phone. It's ridiculously expensive. But all of these companies recognize we're doing something different and they're treating us as something different where we uh, put in these devices. Like if you want this to work, well, say in Bhutan, okay. The, so the Telco in Bhutan, I don't know the name of it, but but that would be the SIM that would be like preloaded or into the devices. Hey, yes, go ahead. This. That's my... Uh, long lost cousin from the University of Syracuse, Lee McKnight. Mm -hmm. That's backpack and internet and backpack. That's, that's my online course. We do Blue Blue House. So these are people around the world joined our call. That started at. Hi, Glenn. Okay. Um, so the and the whole thing is designed to be lightweight, uh, with about about fifteen kilograms. Uh, to or 15 pounds, eight, kilo, eight, eight kilograms to uh, you know about 15 to 20 pounds. So it's it's perfectly portable. Um, it's uh, the model is basically it's just a standard uh, emergency medical technician backpack. Um, this this model is a little bit older. The current models you don't need to open it up. It has the antennas built in. To, uh, into the backpack itself. And, okay, so I'll, I'll go on to the next slide and we'll turn back to any questions I haven't answered. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, okay, so, so th this is <laughs> what I've been saying. So behind the scenes, what we're talking about is uh, tying everything together from cloud to edge across many different types of networks, many different types of devices. We're sort of have been working on this very complex model for a long time and we're only up to 0 0.5. And that sort of underlies uh, the whole approach for connecting and protecting devices, infrastructure, content, users, and non-person entities. And non-person entities is basically everything that's not a human. Uh, so everything has an identity, everything has an ID, and what we're doing is essentially matching up the IDs, essentially the IDs of the cell phones, the satellite thing, the, the battery, everything has an identity, and we're essentially bringing these groups of identities, basically you can drop it anywhere, and as long as they know and can trust each other with security in the secure cloud architecture approach, we can uh, make this work, and the proof is, we're in 11 countries on five continents, and the company that makes a backpack doesn't have anybody like on the ground physically in uh, nine of those countries. And, and these keep working. So they wouldn't, in, if, if, if they wouldn't work if, if the theory was wrong. And the theory has been developed. And so this is going back to infrastructure, having a cyber physical infrastructure. Let me say that again, cyber physical 
infrastructure. So that's what we've really been evolving and we're sort of advocating for experiments, thinking about both the physical infrastructure and the cyber aspects and marrying them, them together with what we call edgeware. You can call it something else. We call it also cloud to edge. So that's uh, the kind of theory behind it. We're not gonna go into all those details unless you students want to, but that's where this came from out of many years of work on sort of a theory for tying cyber physical infrastructure together. Next slide. Okay, so if the proof this works is now that we, with these internet backpacks, if you have several of them, you could tie them together and essentially create a mesh network of backpacks and any other traditional broadband infrastructure. And that can be used for education as it's being used in the Congo, in uh, Liberia, in Kenya, and uh, Costa Rica, Chile, and so on. Or it can also be used similarly for by first responders or medical for uh, different communities. Um, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to wrap up early so we have plenty of time for discussion. Um, and um, and uh, think about like, what does this mean? What is this all about? Well, we you all know uh, that half the world does not have access to the internet. And I just said, we can drop these internet backpacks anywhere. Now they're not cheap. They're, well, I, they're pretty cheap. They're much cheaper than traditional infrastructure, uh, but but there's has to be some way to bring infrastructure and education to all those millions of people. Now in the current pandemic, it's become crystal clear to people in the United States that you know, um, low income communities in cities low in rural areas that can are not connected are all all have the same challenges you can't in in in, in these current worst case scenario conditions you know children can't get educated people can't work if they can't be connected to a network so having a mobile flexible adaptable and standardized community network can help a lot we think because so this backpack it's it's only got these two cell phones, but those cell phones aren't just, those are basically the control units for everything. So you can sort of manage all resources from those mobile phones. There's various apps on them as well for this service. And uh, so we can manage up to 25 users. There can be up 25 active users per backpack. So you could think like a classroom or a small village could be connected from the pack obviously you're not going to get the same entertainment internet uh, that people enjoy elsewhere where you can have a fiber optic connection but you have connectivity you can provide services you can provide content and you can interact in ways that uh, wasn't possible before so where we're going and where we think is the the implication is having uh, dynamic resource sharing partnerships for innovation, this is one innovation. I'm I'm proud of it. I'm happy for what we've done, and I think it has wide application in addressing the needs of billions, literally billions of people that are not connected now. Uh, but there's more needed, uh, and and each in each community, it's not going to be the same kind of um, partnership and the same kind of internet governance structure is, will work because all, all different communities have different needs. So you could start, I started with the story of you know one director of one Goma volcano observatory insisting that I need this now. Okay, well, he that happens to be a United Nations funded observatory. So he already had better resources and already had better connectivity than most everybody in the Democratic Republic of Congo, but he needed more to help protect the community around him. So that's a different partnership if you don't have an active volcano. But working together, and that's what this whole course is about, uh, of you know, finding ways to bring and align different stakeholder communities for internet governance and for resource sharing and development is what you're all trying to do. So I salute you all. Uh, and I think it's absolutely, this is, a, this is an example. This is what you can do if universities and governments and private firms, community organizations, technical community and civil society work together. 
now we're getting to near my final point. So we have plenty of time, uh, maybe like more like 20 minutes instead of 15 for uh, open discussion. If you, the, the low internet penetration in many parts of the world, it's, it's, it's clear. Well, I've been saying this for a long, for, for years, but in this pandemic, it's obvious. It's an ongoing global emergency if there's no access to the internet and no access, that means no access to healthcare, no access to education or limited access to education, limited access to resources. So being creative and thinking through a variety of different approaches and public private and philanthropic partnerships that can contribute for research education and for internet governance is, I think that's what you're all in school for, and that's the, your challenge uh, going forward. I look forward to discussing with you. Last slide, is there another slide or is that it? Okay, now we get to the, yeah, so the takeaway, say, okay, so what would you do with an internet backpack? What would you do with 150, 1500? 150 million of these things at roughly 25 per person, per person, that would sort of, be, that alone would sort of close the gap. It wouldn't, it wouldn't provide everybody with a gigabyte uh, to the to the home or wherever they are, but it would connect people. Uh, so that's, I did a rough ballpark test, that's under $10 billion there. So, uh, and I should disclose now that I mentioned money. So I'm, I'm on the board of the company Imcon International that makes the internet backpack. So I do have a financial conflict of interest. So I'm not actually suggesting, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I want you to think about, you know, what could you do? What could be different? Would this actually help in your situation? What, what, uh, what, what are your ideas? And I think that's it. And I'll stop. So, Lee, this is Alfredo, and since I heard your uh, presentation uh, while I was in another meeting, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but if if a, a organization would be interested uh, to use this tool, uh, uh, which is really creative and it's, you know, it's innovative, to to deal with the uh, digital inclusion that some people call digital divide, but I prefer yeah. digital inclusion. Uh, is there any way, I'm just asking, if, if a government can block this service once it is <laughs> up and running? Okay, so that's an excellent question because I uh, remember the, the very first one went into this hot zone with uh, 12 different uh, fighting groups with UN peacekeepers, with a very um, corrupt uh, government, notorious for killing activists of different types. Um, so there's there's one answer. There's two answers. Basically, the obviously all these different devices radiate some kind of uh, radio frequency signal uh, over different geographies. Um, so. Um, so I can't guarantee that, you know, that the pack, basically if you have a backpack and it's turned, well, here, here's the beauty. If, if this, I'll, I'll give a couple answers here. So the first thing is, you know, this back, the one I have here has a label that talks about Syracuse University and a bunch of different companies that are helping with this, Internet Society. Um, but if you didn't have this label, this is just an, a plain black backpack. So we've had uh, social activists, at various uh, meetings, say that's great because it's it's not obvious that this is anything special or unusual. It just a, it look, just looks like another backpack. So we can we've uh, tra it's easy to transport and carry it anywhere without necessarily attracting suspicion when everything's off. Now, when things are on, um, can the government block the Wi-Fi? Yeah, it could sort of jam a local Wi-Fi signal. Can the government block cell network? Yes. Can the government block the going from some location to this to a satellite? Well, again, in principle, governments can do that too. But first, they're going to have to find this thing. And why would they be targeting this particular satellite? So, so in principle, this can communicate without government's awareness or uh, easy ability to block it. 
Now, there is a second aspect, which is uh, if if you're uh, why why would the, then if that's the case, then why would the government ever let these into any country, right? Well, so all these devices, all these resources are also going back out, you know, sending a signal back out to the cloud to some data center. And we do have an acceptable use policy. So, so in principle, and this is the full disclosure, so the, the company now, Imcon International, knows exactly where every single backpack is on earth. So where, where you know, it, like literally, it, it knows the GPS coordinates of where the backpacks are. And so if the GPS coordinates show a backpacks on some known, you know, drug smuggling route, the company could, or a government could pressure the company to say, you know, shut it down. So, or if, if, if a backpack is stolen, we can shut it down and turn it into a brick and make it unusable. So there is some challenging privacy and security issues here because right now this small company has this power to you know, be aware, but it needs to have that to support the services remotely, right? Um, we are, are working very, we have uh, the secure cloud architecture with this includes security and privacy by design. But as this goes forward, there may be needed uh, to have uh, explicit policy. So that's a long way of saying, yes, in principle, it can be shut down, but in practice, we, we know that we can also, uh, it can also be kind of hidden and brought anywhere. Great. Um... Hi, hi, Lee. It's Glenn. Um, yeah. So everybody can see the family resemblance. Same, same <laughs> mother, different father. Uh, but uh, greeting everyone. Um, sorry to be late. Um, so I have another question. It's from Alfredo. Uh, mm -hmm. Could this edgeware be conducive to fragmentation of the internet, or just promote community networks? Yeah. So, so the edgeware itself, uh, you could think of it. It will also in terms of uh, blockchain where we're talking about like decentralized resource coordination with trust. Uh, so Edgeware in principle is, is a resource. It could help, so in, in principle, being able to manage uh, decentralized resources with higher degrees of trust is, um, is what, what this is about. There are two types. We have Edgeware that sort of works completely autonomously where it could just be working like in that, you know, off grid without tying back to the internet. But usually the internet, the edgeware would be tied back to some data center, to some as like pre-established identity and resources. So it wouldn't really be fragmenting. Basically it'd be, well, the reason we've gotten started in some of the big uh, cloud companies like us is we can help them manage resources at the edge where their traditional architectures and approaches don't work. Great, thank you. So let me uh, go to, uh... Mr. Yusuf, uh, he says, how easily accessible is tech support for the backpacks if things don't go right? As all things, things don't always go right. So, for example, when you're around a volcano and tech glitches occur. So, I guess you can share with us some uh, examples of when things just didn't go right and how was it resolved? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, well, first I have to say the, you know, the person that took the volcano up the... Back, uh, the, the backpack up the volcano he, he's a wizard programmer himself so so he and he's part of the company now that makes uh, the software so he's tech support so we did have tech support uh, but that that came after the fact at the time it was like written so so the um, essentially if you can reach the internet so all these different devices like the the cradle point router or the cell phones, or the satellite service, they all have, there's a, there's a remote tech support. So if you essentially, if you can reach out to the internet, then you can get help. Uh, if you're completely unconnected, then it, yes, then then we can't help you. But if you can reach the internet, we can, we're, there is support. And okay. again, this has been uh, proven in that the back, there's, there's nobody, there wasn't even anybody in the company that spoke Spanish, you know, but we've been growing in Costa Rica and Chile, and now we get with uh, distributors and supporters. So essentially what we're trying to do is have at least one, you know, technical company or support partner in a different region to provide that backup and support. But in principle, as long as you can reach the internet, you can get some level of tech support. Okay, I got a question from Eduardo. 
Um, and again, um, it stays along with the same kinds of line. Uh, do you need to contract services with satellite companies before acquiring these backpacks? And if so, how much do the, does that cost? I guess yeah, it varies. Yeah, everything. This is a. This is a. The backpack is a, a cyber physical bundle of resources, and all you do is acquire the pack, and that comes with you know built in the data plans. That, we, we, that you would need either for uh, cell network service or the satellite company, and, um, and or both. So, so that's that's this is a, a bundle uh, product, and uh, and you don't have to separately negotiate with the other parties as an end user. Uh, and because the, those companies, like like Inmarsat, recognizes you know they're ready to build a slightly different version of this antenna for us, and the other satellite companies where we can. Essentially, we can get better, we can get cheaper flat rate pricing on satellite services than people normally can because of our approach here. So you don't want to approach those companies directly. You want to just uh, deal with Imcon or its resellers. Yeah, that. thank you. Uh, that, that goes back to a question that uh, Senor Costa said from Venezuela. And he was saying, he was asking basically, uh, what actual satellite can the satellite be chosen, or is it married? I guess uh, twin to the backpack supplier. Are they committed to only one satellite provider? No, no. We like I say, we started with one uh, for basically we, we were looking for you know the best in different parts of the world. You can get different satellite networks have different uh, strengths, and uh, depending on the an application, where uh, you know we're, we're optimized like this. There's careful balance of resources to not use too much energy, not to use too much bandwidth, not too much charge. But if, if you're a, like if you're an energy exploration company, for example, and you say, you know what, I wanna have video calls to my workers back to headquarters. And I, so I want a bigger dish antenna and I wanna use a different, we, we okay, the, the concrete example of President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in uh, the former president of Liberia, her grandchildren live in Georgia. She wants to see her grandchildren. Okay, so she has an internet backpack, but she's using an upgraded, you know, satellite antenna and receiver because that's what what she wants to do. So, so the, there's a baseline model and a bundle that works for most of the world, but we there's also customization that can be done for as needed. And so we're we're currently working with Inmarsat, but we also have partnerships with several other satellite companies. And, uh, and and many different device manufacturers. Great, thank you. Okay, I got another question from Kapal. Um, how internet backpacks for edge connectivity improves universal principle of internet access for the unconnected community? Yes, well, that's that's really one of the key points here is, you know, we're going into countries like Liberia and Democratic Republic of Congo where the internet penetration is like 4% or 7%, and we're saying 25 people can connect now to this one backpack. Uh, we did try to, uh, so in principle, you should be able to provide uh, many people access at much lower cost. So this is much, and, and the telecommunications companies like us too, because it's cheaper to extend beyond the traditional telecommunications network with these backpacks than to build out like a 4G or 5G network into very rural Community, so we think this is a universal access solution for rural and remote communities. Great, thank you. Um, a, a question for me, uh, Lee. Um, uh, Avery Dory, who was uh, one of our, our speakers uh, recently, she spoke about um, her the multi-stakeholder model. But I know, as a, as a person deeply involved with uh, IETF, but she did work with the SAMI in northern. Um, Sweden, and she actually created a, uh, a mesh network with with their reindeer. And I've also heard of a case where uh, I think it was in Thailand, where uh, people who uh, basically on motorcycles they became a web as well. Yeah. So, so I, I guess what you are is one of the innovative technologies that are serving the underserved. Um, you know, it, because many of these countries, these are people off the grid in many ways, whether it's in power or water or, or as we see here in the Internet. Now, um, are you going to be speaking at the, the next IGF in, in Poland? 
Um, I, I haven't, um, I, yeah, so I, I haven't been, uh, I've been busy and I, I'm not on the schedule right now. If, if there's a session that I could participate in for the next IGF that you're aware of, I'd be happy to. As you know, Glenn, we met at the IGF in Paris and I've been a supporter and participant in um, IGF since uh, the beginning, but I don't have, I can say the, the current, the current internet backpack has evolved. Like what you, you're, you're seeing, Glenn, the same pack that I brought to uh, Paris two years ago. Now the version is much better and much more automated. And so it's okay. much, there's these concerns about using it. It's much simpler to operate now uh, and much more ready for people to sort of take anywhere without needing technical support. That's, that's fantastic. Well, everything takes time. Uh, one of the questions in the, uh, from Alfredo was how many uh, developing countries have actually implemented the device? How many have been distrib distributed? I guess that's what he's getting at. Yeah, well, so we, like I say, it's in, I'm trying to think, in, uh, of the 11 countries, it's, it's in Australia, but with the Aborigine communities for education is a first use there in Canada with First Nations. And in the United States, it's been used, um, well, Syracuse, New York City schools, emergency services. But so aside from those three countries, I guess eight most of the countries where this backpack is deployed are, are would you put in some level of a middle income or developing country from um, Africa to Latin America. Uh, and of course, there's a lot more to the world to go. Uh, so um, I'm not here to try to sell the pack or to promote the company. But that, that is how, uh, it, there's plenty of opportunities for this to go further around the world. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I just shared in the, um, in the uh, chat as well uh, that the, there's a lot of good case studies by Jane Coffin. Uh, yeah. She's responsible for community networking with, with ISOC. And if any of you folks are ISOC members, please do bear in mind there's two sources of funding uh, for local events. One is, is sort of beyond the net, and that's up to $30,000. But also, you can take advantage of the ISOC Foundation funding opportunities. And disaster relief is one of the core five things the foundation is doing. So what Lee is doing is actually right up the alley for yeah, that. So certainly between Syracuse University, uh, both the, myself wearing my faculty hat, and IMCON International, the company, I'm sure would be happy to participate and partner with those thinking of applying for grants there. I wanted to address Rexon Acosta's question about yes. what about if there's no line of sight and uh, can you switch to a different satellite? So so yeah, no, we, we wouldn't, the, the company would not provide a backpack to um, Venezuela that was pointing at a satellite for Kenya. That that wouldn't happen. So so you you would be you would be uh, your your backpack would be married to satellite services that would work in the part of the world where you are, or we wouldn't sell it to you in the first place. Um, and and in, in the case of Inmarsat, they have a whole they have a very wide constellation. So so there'd be different uh, satellites that would they would be directed to depending on your geography. Great, thank you, um, Alfredo. As as a good uh, as a as a good um, administrator yeah. and dean of this program, he's reminded everyone: please fill out the survey. If I can also add to that, we could continue a lot of this discussion in our discussion thread under development section. So I, I will put in some of the links to some of the GHTC papers done by Nestor. I'll add uh, I'll add a bunch of resources by the DC Coalition. That's the IGF group, and also the much of the stuff uh, on the open source router stuff that has been done by by the people of Argentina. But I think this is a great discussion. Unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. We've, we, the hour has gone really quickly. It's, it only feels like a half an hour for me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's a joke. I, I got okay. it. Sorry. I'll, I'll tell you, I tried, I, I wanted, my original design was to use that open source router in the pack, but it, they weren't ready to go out when we were ready to go. So, so we had to do what we had to do. Well, nice yeah. talking with you all. Thanks so much, Glenn, Alfredo, everyone. Look forward to further interaction. Bye. Great. Thank, you. Thank you again. And this will be, uh, we'll be stopping the recording. The recording will be available and will be put up into the YouTube channel. So we'll make sure we get it to you later and we'll, we'll continue the dialogue. Okay. See ya. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lee. Yep. Bye, Eduardo. Thanks.